This is the second webinar in our series on emerging Midwest invasives. Uh, today we're going to be hearing about um, myelin minute weed, Persicaria perfoliata, and our guest speaker for the day is Dr. Shika Singh from the Jackson Lenaway Washtenaw uh, Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. Uh, before I give Shika a formal introduction, uh, I just want to again let everybody know who just joined that we are recording this meeting. Um, and I want to also make sure we take a moment here and thank our sponsor for this webinar. Uh, at the beginning of this year, MIPIN um, put out a request for uh, business and organizational sponsorships for this year. And we are really happy to report that we've had some businesses uh, take advantage of that. And one of them is the Invasive Species Center, and they are the sponsor for today's webinar. Um, the Invasive Species Center uh, prevents the introduction and spread of high risk invasive species in Canada. Uh, they do this by connecting stakeholders with knowledge and technology. They are a respected partner and leader in invasive species science, education, and action. Uh, I've put their uh, the link to their website at the bottom of this slide. I'll also put it in the chat uh, once, the once our uh, main presentation gets going. Uh, even if you don't have to be in Canada to take advantage of the resources and information they have available, um, if you're anywhere in the Great Lakes region, I think you'll find information there that you'll find really valuable. Uh, and I also will be putting a link in the chat. So if your organization would like to be a sponsor of MIPIN, that's still something you can take advantage of. There's other perks, but this, but sponsoring a webinar is one of them. We also accept individual donations. Um, a lot of our education outreach activities like this are not specifically funded in any way. So even a $5 donation, uh, it goes a long way. So we appreciate any amount that you're able to give. No obligation, but we appreciate it. And just a very brief overview of um, the Midwest Invasive Plant Network, or MIPIN. Uh, we were formed in 2003. Uh, we are a network, so our role really is to coordinate um, among agencies and organizations across the Midwest, which for us means uh, the nine states you see here, plus the province of Ontario. And our mission is simple. It's to reduce the impacts of invasive plants in the Midwest. And being aware of new and emerging invasive species is an important part of that. The um, species that we're talking about this year, um, we came up with this list, um, what we're calling our top 10 list, um, by doing a survey at the end of last year. We reached out to Midwest uh, invasive species experts um, from all of our states and provinces in our region. We got 65 responses altogether. And these are the top 10 um, species that these experts indicated were of greatest concern. These are new, these are not either not in the Midwest yet, but they're in near, uh, but they're in neighboring regions, or they may have just um, started popping up in the Midwest and they're in small pockets, but we're concerned about further spread. So these are species that we really want on people's radar. Uh, there were 50 species named altogether in the survey. And if you want to see that full list, as well as a similar survey we did in 2020, you can kind of compare uh, how things have changed over the last few years. Uh, you can do that at our website. Uh, the link is below, and I'll also put that in the chat. And lastly, come on, slides. Oh, I'm having some trouble here. Okay, well, um, the other thing that's available on our slide is I made a flyer that highlights all 10 of these species and also indicates which states they are of most concern for. And I will also put a link to that publication in our chart. It's just a free download from our website. Um, okay, I am going to stop screen sharing and invite Chika to share her slides. Okay. And while she does that, I'm gonna give you a little introduction. Um, we're very, um, Grateful to have her here today sharing her expertise. Shika Singh is a biologist for the Jackson County Conservation District. She's also the coordinator for the Jackson Lenaway Washtenaw Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area, or the JLW SISMA. Uh, she performs invasive species survey and management activities and provides education and outreach opportunities uh, within her tri county region. Uh, she also is, seeks ways to increase the reach of environmental education and capacity within underserved communities. She completed her bachelor's at the University of Western Ontario and came to Michigan State University for her graduate work. 
Her master's uh, research focused on water and sediment quality in the lower Grand River and on Lake Michigan beaches. Beach. Oh, is that? And, and her PhD okay. research centered on the water policy and conservation efforts of local and county governments. We're also very happy to share that Sheikha is a new member of the uh, Midwest Invasive Plant Network Board. So thank you, Sheikha, for being here, and I will turn it over to you. Excellent. Um, I am super excited to be here, and I really um, enjoy my time with the uh, MIPIN so far, and I hope to continue, uh, especially all the great work that you all do. And um, thank you for the sponsor of today's presentation, the Canadian Invasive, the Invasive Species Center. With that, I am going to get started. I know the species of the hour, mile a minute weed. Uh, that's a common name that I'm used to saying, so that's probably um, what I'll keep referring to. Um, and those for our um, northern friends, uh, maybe we can refer to it as 1.6 kilometers a minute weed, um, if you're all okay with that. All right, so let's get started. Just to kind of set the base, um, to kind of, uh, in case there are people that are new who are not familiar with invasive species, invasive species are one a species that is not native to the area, so it's not here, and whose introduction causes or has is likely to cause some type of harm to either the environment, to human health, or to the economy. It's either one of those or a lot of them. And so invasive species are getting increasing um, buzz in the media, which is a good to see because you know it is it is something that's important and um, impacts a lot of our industry, et cetera. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So some of you may be wondering what the heck is a SISMA. So a SISMA is a Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. And it's basically a unit, um, a group of partners and stakeholders who have come together to address invasive species issues in an area. We are grant funded, so we are very uh, appreciative of the Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program, also the um, GLRI Restoration Grant Initiative, um, to get funding from that. And then we also have a lot of partner support um, and small grants and stuff to help us uh, do what we do. And so what is it that we do? We do a lot of education and outreach, uh, things like this. We host our own uh, meetings and webinars and training sessions. We do a lot of survey and management activities, consulting and you know site visits. We, we like to help people figure out what's going on in the area and provide uh, input. Um, into things that they're doing, or if they're trying to um, improve an area, add natives or remove invasives. So there is a person like me that covers every single county in Michigan. So we're really excited to, to see that. And we also want to recognize that, you know, the a group that we, um, that we are has different names across the, the nation. So it could be a CWWA, a CISMA, or some other name, but there are a lot of groups like us out there willing and excited to help you um, address some of your invasive species issues. The JLW SISMA, so we're Jackson, Lenaway, and Washtenaw County, so we're in the southern part of Michigan. We have a variety of unique areas that we're really uh, proud of. You know, Ives Road Fan, that's like a, a TNC property, a lot of, you know, wetlands, parks, refuges, we have a, um, a waterfowl refuge called Watkins Lake State Park and County Preserves so that's jointly managed by the state and a local county organization. And, you know, sees a lot of birds, a lot of insects. And we also have a variety of unique species. A couple I wanna highlight, the Mitchell satyrs. There's very few um, areas in our region that have the ability to support uh, this species. And then we have the Massasauga rattlesnake and it's really kind of cool that we have a melanistic uh, version, um, which is, you know, really, um, really, really dark black. And if you look in the sun, you can kind of see that saddle patch glistening. It looks like an oil sheen. And then in addition, we have like, you know, mussels and blandings, turtles, et cetera. So we have a lot of species worth protecting in this area. As with some of your areas, you know, agriculture is a really important part. Um, in Michigan in general, you know, we're third in the nation for like apples and um, grapes and Christmas trees. Well, grapes are, you know, eighth and Christmas trees were number three. Uh, so the agricultural industry contributes more than 
$104 billion to the state's economy, and also in the Jackson, Lenawee, Washtenaw region. And in the map I showed you of the of our region, you can kind of see that we have a mix of agriculture and urban and natural areas. So the goal for today's talk is to just give you a brief flavor of what mile a minute weed is, what it looks like, uh, discuss some of the impacts and vectors, and also kind of go through on a superficial level, like some of the management um, actions you can take if you happen to have mile a minute um, on your property or you know someone that does. So uh, the species of the hour, um, as you had mentioned, it was Persicaria perfilata. It all had a different name, Polygonum perfoliatum, um, just in case that you're more familiar with that one. So some of the common names, mile a minute weed, Asiatic tear thumb, devil's tail, uh, you might see that. And Asiatic tear thumb um, will kind of come a little bit more um, apparent when we talk about management and why that name could be there. This uh, species is in the buckwheat family, so Polygonaceae, and it's the same family as our favorite friend, Japanese knotweed. And so you can kind of imagine that it is, both of those species are very difficult to manage. It is an annual vine. And if you look at this very specific drawn map, uh, the native range for this species is in East Asia, you know, India, Jap Japan, and uh, Philippines. Um, so yeah, so we kind of give a broad range over there. So I want to introduce um, you to this species, and there's a lot of pictures, and I want to draw your attention that some of these pictures will have dates on it, and I'll discuss what some of those dates mean a little bit later in the presentation. But uh, to start off with, uh, one of the most telltale signs of mile a minute weed is its light green triangular shaped leaves. Um, and if you look at the pictures over here, this is like the what I call the front part. And then if you flip it over, it's a little bit lighter, triangular, about one to three inches wide, and it's got waxy cuticles. And it has really cool recurved barbs on its stems. So that's another telltale sign. And if you look at the leaves, uh, sometimes you can kind of tell there is a little bit of texture. There's a little bit of a, a barb or a little bit of a um, bump as you look along the edges. But it is a pretty, you know, it looks almost like an equilateral triangle. And it can grow about 20 to 25 feet long. And in its peak, it can actually grow, you know, six inches a day. So it kind of gives you an idea of why it's called mile a minute weed because it, it grows really quickly. It has white flowers and blue fruits. And it's really, really difficult to actually find these flowers and fruits. I had to take a billion pictures and I'm going to be honest, um, some of these pictures were kind of accidental. I just took broad pictures and I zoomed in when I was looking for fruit pictures, um, you know, the like teapots and the flowers. And so I, I, I realized that I actually had some. And so if you look at this top picture, the teapot um, is visible here. And then, you know, the flower, the, the reproductive organs um, is inside. And each of these fruit have one seed and it turns blue, um, clumps of blue, as you can see over here. And the seeds can remain viable for up to six years in the seed bank. So here's a couple of good, good pictures. It's a blink and, and you miss uh, seeing the flowering. And just to kind of uh, orientate you all where uh, we're located regards to the hardiness zone, uh, we are right over here. So I think we were like the, the four or five kind of region. And so when we talk about seasonality, uh, we have so much diversity and variance, even within the county as to what we're seeing and when we're seeing things. And so uh, I, you know, I want to kind of highlight the, these are approximations um, because it really does depend on factors such as shade, temperature, moisture, and, you know, what's going on in one county versus the other. So, um, sorry, we're, we're in growing zone like five, six. And so seeds will germinate in early spring. So you might be seeing some right about now, Fly, flowers roughly around June, and the fruits will ripen, you know, early July. And luckily this plant um, is very sensitive. So it will die when it encounters frost. So we are lucky that it is weak in that sense. And so um, 
because it is an annual, it comes up every year. Um, once that plant dies, um, that plant is dead. And so if you look at these dates at the bottom, um, these are from different years, and some of them are from the same site. But if you look, you know, July 19th, we're seeing, you know, in one area, um, some ripening of the fruit, you know, in August, it's like bright blue. But then if you look in September, we still have areas that are, you know, just starting to have um, fruits visible, you know, and they're, they're here and here's September and they're pretty green and they haven't started to turn blue yet. So like I said, it, it is, um, it is uh, very dependent on other factors as to when things are growing and ripening, et cetera. This is kind of a cool picture. I know uh, a lot of people don't tend to show um, pictures of the of their species dead, but I, I was lucky enough to see my element weed in November. Um, this is pretty much when we first uh, noticed it in the area. And from a first glance, it looks like it's just a bunch of dead trees, clumps of brown. But if you look at these red arrows, it almost looks like nature's little tinsel, you know, just kind of sitting atop some of these trees. So even if you've missed a growing season, you can still keep an eye out for some of these tangled tinsel-like material a little bit close up. Um, and you can kind of see the, the fruit has dried up. And if you open one of these, then you'll get a nice shiny black seed. And if you, so as you do your surveying, even in October, September, uh, whatever, then you can kind of look for some of these telltale signs. You can still see the recurved barbs in some cases. So that'll help, um, help you identify what you're looking at. So some more pictures, subtle, but once you see it, you know, you can't unsee it, right? So how did it actually get here? So now, now you know what it looks like, you know, kind of, you know, some of the seasonality. So let's kind of step back a little bit and talk about how it got here. So the first recorded specimen uh, was in about Portland, about 1890s. Um, it wasn't established and apparently they think it was transported in ship ballast. Now we're not sure, but that's, that's the first thing that I, I saw. In the 1930s, uh, they found it in a Maryland garden but they uh, felt they eradicated it. But then it also was found in a Pennsylvania nursery where it did establish and it started to spread. And there's another kind of cool study out there. I think Schubert, uh, 2001, um, they, I think, looked at genetic variation. And there's a couple of studies and I think there's like a lack of genetic variation of some of those myelominant weed in the area. So they think, or there, it's thought that maybe um, that might be the source of uh, the, the population that we see here. If you look at the ed maps, uh, you can kind of see where some of these areas have mile a minute weed. It's predominantly in the east, east coast, east, eastern part of um, the state, but we do actually have some populations in Michigan. So that's kind of where I pulled up the map here, um, Missin, and you can kind of see it's concentrated more in the in the southern part of um, Michigan. Like most invasive species, it prefers open, disturbed areas, you know, chaotic areas. Um, we've seen it in wetlands, along stream banks, right-of-ways, roads, utility corridors, edges of woods, in parks. Uh, you name it, it'll probably um, be happy there. It, it does prefer sunny open areas, but we do see it in places that have wet soil. It does tolerate some shade. It, shade may impact you know, the timing of when it um, grows and how fast it grows, but like, like an invasive species, it's here and it's successful because it can adapt to a variety of conditions. And this is a kind of a nice picture it's showing. Uh, this is a, a relatively busy road. And you can kind of see mile a minute kind of growing rampant in this area. This has a, a couple of really cool evolutionary strategies that I want to highlight. It's pretty good at grabbing carbon from the air, efficient at grabbing um, nitrogen from the soil. So even if it's in a poor soil area, it does have mechanisms, the ability to kind of grab what it can. It does do a lot of self-pollination. So it doesn't require other plants. It doesn't require 
other insects or you know, organisms to kind of help pollinate it or find another source. So that in itself saves a lot of time and energy and they don't need anyone else. Like, you know, hey, we're just gonna pollinate ourselves. And the, uh, the plant itself, it, because it grows, you know, 20 to 25 feet, there is a heck of a lot of seeds that could be on that vine. So sometimes some people say like 3,500, you know, some people will um, estimate there's about, you know, 1,500 uh, seeds per vine, but it doesn't matter. I mean, that's still a lot of seeds and the ability for those seeds to get in the soil and form a seed bank. So remember how I was talking about those recurved barbs? And, you know, I, this is a lot better when I do it in person. You can kind of see me jump around a little bit, but, you know, those recurved barbs, they, 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 they form, you know, downwards. So, so it really helps them propel themselves up and move. And so it allows them to kind of grow quickly and in, you know, a direction, you know, of its choosing. But those barbs are also kind of cool because it allows them to kind of cling to other stems you know, a little bit easier. It grows on top of itself. And so it really allows it to kind of get that um, growth edge and try to make its way above other species and even climb above itself. So even this, like, look at this thicket, you know, those barbs are, it's climbing all over itself and you know, it kind of grows really quickly. And so the impacts of this species, uh, some of the basic is that, um, you know, it can cover existing trees and plants. It gets really thick and heavy. And so um, the weight itself can damage and break limbs. And so when it does that, you know, enough times, um, that can eventually kill that tree. Same with photosynthesis, you know, if it covers it, prevents the sunlight from reaching the leaves of that tree, eventually it'll weaken and kill that tree. It also can take over an area, suppress new plant growth, especially um, since it does uh, start germinating and growing before some of the native plants. And in turn, that could eliminate important food and habitat for some of those you know, sensitive species. Um, it could eliminate you know, things for, for bees and pollinator species that they're looking for. And one thing about this plant is that there's really not a big scent that's attracting um, you know, a lot of insects and stuff. So uh, it just, it, it may not, pe they, it may not be a good source of um, food itself for some insects or some uh, plants. And so when it takes over and, and kills, you know, like native plants, like trilliums and lupin or whatever, that could be problematic. And because it grows so quickly, you know, all it takes is a couple of seasons to undo years and years of hard work for those who do restoration. And so that, that's also problematic. Uh, these uh, plants, uh, when they're young, it's not as painful, but when they get bigger and hardier and more mature, those uh, recurved barbs actually kind of hurt and they do scratch. And I know that I've been walking through them and, you know, accidentally and I, I leave with big scratches on it. And in turn, that also impedes recreational quality. I know sometimes I almost face planted because those, those vines get all tangled up and they grasp onto each other that when you are walking through it, um, there is tension and you, you could fall. And who wants to be you know, walking through that or recreating through that? So who should be concerned? Uh, you know, some of the common call outs are fruit and vegetable farmers, people who rely on a single year's growth, um, Christmas tree farms. And as you can see in our, our state, Christmas tree farms are pretty important. And you can imagine, you know, one year, if, if you're relying on it and, you know, mile a minute weed, and, you know, overtakes it, that could be a, a dent in your bottom line profit, especially if it's an area that you don't necessarily visit very often. Uh, restoration folks who have um, land that they're trying to restore or conservation agencies, uh, you know, all that hard work and money that you put in, you don't want that to be, you know, wasted. Parks and, you know, nurseries. And I do like Star Wars and I do have Star Wars references. And so um, why do I have that? And it's, it's kind of a fun way to show that, you know, we're not traveling to other systems or planets yet. Uh, maybe if, if you're a multi-billionaire, trillionaire, you may be, but most of us aren't. But we are traveling to other places and we are shipping things and we are buying things. And so our problems 
could very soon be your problems. And, you know, the, the great thing about these kind of series, um, lectures and presentations is that we want people to get um, quick eye on the problem and trying to address it before it becomes a big issue. And so how are these uh, plants spreading? Well, one of the things that I, I like to highlight is equipment. And if you notice, like some of the farms that we work with, they have different properties in different counties. Um, sometimes they're next to each other. Sometimes they're in different counties. Sometimes they're in different states. And if you own the same farm and it's relatively close, you might be sharing equipment. You might be sharing uh, staff. You may be sharing, uh, um, you know, taking one shipment and moving it to different areas. And so you could be moving it from one area that has the invasive species of myelominate weed to another. Uh, when you're transporting raw and processed crops, you know, you're bringing in mulch, hay, seeds, uh, that could be a source of contamination. And when you have share, a shared workforce, you're using um, um, equipment, you know, looking at your shoes and, and stuff, going from one spot to another, you could be bringing it from one spot to another. And this is actually, you know, relevant to a lot of invasive species. We have found evidence that uh, wildlife like to eat myelominate weeds. I know I've eaten it before just to try it. And a study um, looked at the viability of myelominate seed in deer scat, and they did find that it was viable. And so you see a lot of birds. And so when you have a lot of wildlife, you can kind of see how, um, you know, we have these corridors of like disturbed areas. You might have deer crossing through, you might have birds um, flying through or stopping and going from one area to another, um, especially with like mulch and seeds. They could be, um, you know, visiting or stopping in some of these areas and uh, making a home or bedding down in it. And so they could be depositing seeds, whether it's from scat or on, it, on their fur or um, in their hooves. We've also found this, like I said, near aquatic areas. And so if those um, branches that hold the mile a minute weed fall and they fall into the, the river, it does get transported through. And they have found that, you know, some of these, uh, these seeds do withstand the river travel and get deposited and have um, and have, have routed. They've seen it um, route, uh, root in the st stream bank. And then wind and recreation gardeners, uh, people will sometimes, you know, appreciate, okay, like, hey, this is a really cool plant. I like it. It looks pretty. It offers a lot of shade and I, I don't want to see my neighbors back there. So I want to plant it and um, off they go. And so that, that could be problematic. So we really wanna get people aware of this. So let's look at some of the management strategies. Uh, the first thing that people always ask, you know, what can I do to physically uh, manage mile a minute weed? And so we say that if there's like a small um, infestation or an individual infestation, or maybe if you have a, a sensitive area that has a lot of uh, really cool plants that you're trying to save, then maybe you could uh, take a mechanical approach. Uh, sometimes people don't have access to pesticides. Um, we talk about accessibility, um, even like a, a bottle or a jug of a hundred dollar pesticide may not be something that people can afford or uh, we're seeing staff sort shortages. And so maybe the applicator doesn't have time to, to get to you right now. And so before it becomes a problem, you might wanna start doing some mechanical treatment where you can um, just to buy yourself some time um, when the applicator comes. You also may have health considerations, um, or organic certifications that may require you to um, not use herbicide in your um, treatment program. So some of the methods include hand pulling. They do have short and shallow roots, so you could yank them. But like I mentioned, the barbs on the mature plants, they do kind of hurt. So maybe that's where the Asiatic tear thumb name comes from. And you really wanna focus on trying to pull the entire root. And so maybe, you know, you might wanna look at uh, after a rainstorm when the, when the soil is a little bit moist, you might wanna pull it up then. You could do some trimming or mowing. Um, you definitely wanna do those things before it goes to seed. So once you start mowing and, you know, it's seeding, you could potential to um, spread that invasive sp species to other areas, especially if you're not decontaminating your equipment from site to site. So you could do that. 
The challenges with mechanical methods is that sometimes you won't kill the plant if you're just cutting it and the roots are still there, it'll grow. You might miss some seeds or you might miss some small plants. And you really have to be vigilant, uh, vigilant and very diligent um, on your scheduling. So constantly looking for um, you know, new plants, constantly going out um, and you know, doing your, your cutting and mowing. And sometimes uh, people ask, well, what about fire? Um, fire could be a short-term solution in the sense that you might be able to clear the top part, but you know, it's not going to necessarily kill those seeds um, in, the, uh, in the soil. And so that might be something um, that more research needs to be um, undertaken, but um, those are some of the uh, mechanical ways to address invasive species like myelaminate weed. Herbicide is, is useful when you have larger infestations, places that you can't really um, physically go to pull. Uh, you could use a pre-emergent before germination, so about mid to end March, again, depending on you know, what it's like in your area. And then after you do a pre-emergent, make sure that you do a post-emergent follow-up, um, just to kind of see if you've missed any areas. Um, you can use uh, like triclopyr, which is a broadleaf specific, and then glyphosate has um, has been shown to be useful as well. So triclopyr glyphosate are two that are used to deal with myelaminate weed. Uh, you want to use a non-ionic surfactant so that the um, herbicide will be effectively taken up because it does have that waxy cuticle. And again, if you do decide to use the herbicide route, then make sure that you are using the appropriate herbicide um, for the area. So if you have aquatic areas, rivers, ponds nearby, make sure that you are using an aquatic safe one. The label is a law, so definitely look at the um, label and apply um, the instructions to what you're doing. And again, like most invasive species, you are going to have to monitor for a few years uh, just to make sure that you've gotten rid of the um, soil, the seed bank. I do want to share a case study. So this, uh, this work was done by our colleagues, the BCK SISMA. So thank you for sharing your efforts on this. Um, that they're in Barrie, Calhoun and Kalamazoo County. So we can kind of look our neighbors to the west. So they used 2% um, triclopyr solution um, in all areas except for the cropland. And uh, they also used 2% glyphosate you know, when they were in the cropland area. They found that both uh, of these solutions worked well. Uh, this, the plant turned brown in a couple of hours and it died within hours or it took a couple of days. So um, depending on, you know, how much, how big the infestation was, it, you might, it might take some time to see, um, especially when some of that um, vine is like stacked on top of each other. They did revisit the treated sites uh, three to four weeks after treatment. Um, and so they they had they did see some uh, germination, and so they did notice that the seeds will germinate after vegetative plants were killed, and so at least one follow up treatment was needed, and they are looking to do some more um, work on this and to to see well maybe do we need more than one follow up treatment. So this is a relatively new infestation to the area, so we um, are looking at it, and there's still more work and knowledge to be gained about how myelaminate weed is operating in this area. I don't wanna um, go too much into biocontrol, but there is a biocontrol option. I know that some of the states out into the east are using the black weevil. Um, right now, I'm, I, and I'm not gonna say this properly, but rhino, hominis latipes from China. Um, myelaminate weed is a host. Like I said, it's used by the Eastern states. Both the adult and the juveniles feed on the plant and it does cause damage and that damage could impact um, water transport, nutrient transport. And so you can kind of see some pictures um, of the damage that these uh, weevils do. So potentially, I mean, depending on what we find and, and if we find more infestations, um, this could be something that we are we might look to using. But that, that's all I'm going to say about this right now. Um, there are more 
people out there with better knowledge on this. And so hopefully we could have a, a session on just biocontrol because it's a really fascinating area of, of study. So some of the challenges uh, that we are facing with mile a minute weed in this area is awareness. Like we are seeing a lot of invasive species moving in. So trying to get mile a minute weed in people's you know, frame of reference and getting them aware that this plant exists because we're getting things like uh, spotted lantern fly, you know, also. And so trying to pull people and, or people are getting pulled in different directions, you know, beech leaf disease. Um, so this is just one of another species. And because it is new in the area, it's really important that we increase people's awareness. And this is the um, really famous invasion curve. Uh, you know, obviously if you, you address it in the beginning, it takes less time and less money uh, to you know, manage that infestation. But over time, if you don't do anything about it, uh, you know, the control costs uh, skyrocket and it takes more time um, to address those infestations. And at that point, when you're down here, you're probably just trying to keep it at bay or, or do some local control and management. You're not looking at an eradication here. So, because this is a new um, species in our area, we don't know the extent of infestation or exactly where it is or how it got here. And we are still trying to adapt uh, management strategies to suit our locations. And one of the issues that our partners, uh, the BC cases, had is like, you know, trying to reach landowners for treatment. You know, you have a lot of people who own land um, in one area, but they actually don't live there. And so, and many times it's you know a big open field. Maybe there's some farming going on, maybe not. But then you know no matter how much you try to call them or leave notes or mail them information, if they don't get back to you, um, it could be a challenge when it comes to managing it because you can't at this point you know treat or manage or do anything on people's properties without permission. Um, so at this point, um, that is is something to kind of consider. If you do see mile a minute wheat, um, there are a couple places uh, where it would be good to report it. So one, contact your local CISMA and you can also report it on MISSIN. This is like an app that we use, highly recommend it. It's hosted by um, Michigan State University and it has a website and it's also something that you can download on your phone. A lot of really cool educational, um, identification training can be found on this website, or you can also report it on EdMaps. I have a couple of resources. I know we just kind of superficially went over some of this information, but I know Michelle is going to put some of these links into the chat. Um, so uh, you all could uh, maybe look at that for ideas of like, you know, like treatment mixtures and get an idea of different names of um, of herbicide brands that use, you know, triclopyr or glyphosate. So um, that's it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, drop them in the chat. I know, um, I know this is like a like a new species for some of us, but trying to get a handle on it early is definitely helpful. Thank you so much, Sheikha. I. I have not seen any questions pop up in the chat, um, but oh, we just got one. So, um, so take if everyone wants to take a minute, you know, go ahead. You could put those in now. Um, so we did have a question here. Um, it says you mentioned it was difficult to find ripe fruits. Do you think it's because they are consumed quickly by wildlife? I think sometimes um, people are just not. It's just inconspicuous, and so. If you're just walking by, it may just look like a tangled um, mass of of vines. And also, the thing with the with the flowers is that the flowers itself are like really small. So if I oops, if I go back to it, you know they're, they're so small and they're only there for a short amount of time, right? So I mean, it just looks like the. I mean, it very quickly goes from this to like fruit. So that's another thing. It's just it's just not there for very long. 
And I'm glad you mentioned about about taking into consideration when it goes to seed and when you do any kind of physical management. Mm -hmm. um, do you maybe want to highlight that again? I think that's an important point, especially because this this can set fruit on the earlier side than other plants, can't it? Yeah, and so definitely um, you want to do you know like the cut the cutting before the fruits appear, just so you're not spreading it around. And I would say that you know, before, you know, end of, you know, before the, um, before the, you know, the frost, if, if you're treating it when the frost before, just before the frost, I would say the fruit has probably already been, you know, laid and there's already dropping and seeds, animals have been eating it. So definitely the, um, the summertime end of summer would be the last time, the last part of, of herbicide. I would try to do it before. And we do have another question about herbicide treatment. It says, do you spray the leaves and at the roots? Um, yeah, for foliar spray, we, we target um, looking at the leaves. Okay, well, I just, um, if, if we get another question or two, we've, we do have just a couple more minutes of our time, mm -hmm. so I will keep an eye on that. Um, but um, as we're wrapping up, I do just want to, again, thank uh, Shika Singh for her time today and for sharing her expertise. Um, if anyone has questions uh, about um, finding this recording or more information about the species, um, I'm going to drop my um, email in the chat and you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, and what? also uh, in the, I do want to just put another pitch in that um, if you want to help support, you know, future webinars, um, there's a there's a link uh, that I put in earlier in the chat where you can make a donation to MIPN and we always appreciate that. Um, and we thank you all for being here and for your interest in invasive species. And I did drop and one of those links is a link to like new a New Jersey site where they actually, you know, sell the weevils to, to their folks. So if you have questions about it, you know, how successful, I mean, they may be um, a good place to start and call them and, and ask them. For the for the biocontrol, you mean? Yes, yes. Yeah, there are a few places out east that are working on that. Yeah, we we, we can help connect you to those resources. Yeah, I think the key with this species is to just um, find it quickly and early. Um, I mean, it is, it's, it's like a, I want to say standard, but it is like a typical invasive species where you just a typical, you know, herbicide um, application to kind of treat it. And so there's nothing really like tricky in that sense. Like the basic um, treatment methods are there. It's just finding it and being aware that it's there to do something about. Okay. We have uh, one last question that I saw pop in. This will be the last one we'll take today. Um, sure. Did you do you see this in the chat, Shika? It's about stinger crystals. Um, no, I have not. I don't know anything about stinger crystals. Okay, something so for us. I'll something for us to that. learn. It sounds like. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, yes, this is just a reminder. This is being recorded. The link will be the same place where you registered for the webinar. I will put a link to the recording. Um, that'll be available a little later this month, um, but it will be available. So um, if you if you came in late or had any trouble joining, um, this will the full presentation will be available. So thank you again, everyone. We appreciate your time and your interest. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Shika. Thank you.